Hey, what's up? I'm Jason, and today I want to show you something that I think will come in really handy if you're a game developer or you're thinking about getting into game development. It's an easy trick that you can use in all of your game projects that you can just drop right in right now with really no extra work, and it'll save you a lot of time along the way and fix some serious problems that might come up. Now, what kind of problems am I talking about? Well, maybe you've got designers on your team or other developers on your team and you've exposed some attributes for your items. Perhaps you've set a weight value in there and the designers have no idea what to do with that weight value. They start setting random values and your player suddenly can't move and then you're wasting half a day trying to debug why is player movement broken and finding out, oh, well, they changed the weight of the default boots to be 3 million or something so the player can't walk anymore or maybe they change the NPC's base health down to zero so the NPCs are all spawning and blowing up and dying. These kinds of things happen all the time in indie game development, AAA game development, pretty much anywhere unless you make it so that it's harder to do and easier to just kind of fall into the pit of success. So that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to give you some really simple things that you can use called attributes that we can drop right into the editor that'll allow you to limit what the designers can put into a field, make sure that they're actually putting in a correct value and allow you to expose a whole lot of extra functionality without writing new code. You might want to run some code at debug time. Perhaps you've been considering writing a console that just runs commands because you need to run some methods or something else. We'll cover how to do that and how to do a whole lot more, how to add buttons right into your editor without writing custom inspectors, and a lot of other fun stuff. So if you're into game development, you're doing anything at all, just follow along and I'll take you through at least the most important ones. There are a ton of these attributes out there. I'm not going to hit them all. I'm going to hit the ones that I think you'll actually use, the ones that I see designers and developers actually using day to day. And then I'll give you a link to the list of all the other ones for the off edge cases that you might run into. But first, don't forget to check out the Ultimate Game Dev course. For those of you who don't already know, the Ultimate Game Dev course is a huge online course where my friend Thomas Brush and I have put together all of our courses in one giant bundle for the price of just one. Whether you're looking to advance your skills or maybe you've never looked at code before, this course will definitely give you the tools that you need to advance your game dev career and take you one step closer to building and releasing your dream game. The course covers hundreds of topics and you'll learn everything from the basics of C-sharp coding to mastering Unity on a more professional level. On top of this, Thomas will teach you incredible art skills to polish your games and make them look great. He'll also teach you everything there is to know about how to successfully launch a game, market it, secure funding, and work with publishers, and even how to get onto the Steam front page. You'll get to enter two amazing Discord communities. They're both full of like-minded developers and industry professionals who you can share your work with and bounce ideas off of. With my courses, you'll also have direct access to me all along in case you have a problem that you just can't solve. My architecture course is still live and meeting weekly throughout the next couple months, but this deal will only be available until August 1st. So if you want it all for the price of one, make sure to join right now. The first type of attributes we're going to talk about today are inspector attributes that show up in our inspector window. These appear whenever we're inspecting an object that's a mono behavior or a scriptable object that's using these custom attributes. We can get things like range sliders, minimum values, and even tooltips that pop up automatically without writing any extra code at all. Let's dive into what this looks like in code. Here we have an item class, and this instance is using a scriptable object so that we can create a bunch of items for our game without creating prefabs. This is just one of many patterns though, and again, this will work just fine on a mono behavior. So if you're using mono behaviors instead of scriptable objects, don't worry, you can still use these exact same attributes. So let's take a look at some of the fields and some of the attributes that I'm using here. First, we've got just a public sprite icon. That's just an icon, it's not using any custom attributes at all. Right below that, however, we have the weight field, and the weight field is using multiple attributes. It's got a minimum value of zero specified by the min attribute. Now, there isn't a max attribute if you're wondering, but there is a min, and it's very handy. We also have a tooltip attribute that's explaining what this does. Now, I found that these tooltips are not just handy in the inspector, but sometimes they can be handy when you're reading through the code. In fact, if you're ever tempted to add a comment to a field because you're having a hard time remembering what it is, I'd just recommend maybe putting a tooltip there instead. I generally like tooltips over comments because they, well, they're read by everybody and they tend to be a little bit more honest. 
Let's look at the next one though. We've got a range attribute for our value. Now I mentioned that there was no max and there is a min. There's also a range. Range allows us to not just specify the minimum and maximum value, but it also automatically gives you these nice little sliders that enforce those limits. And it makes it easy for designers to understand where they are within the limits without you having to spell that all out. I find the range attribute to be one of the handiest of them all. Now let's look at this giant description box. You might have noticed here that I've got multiple lines where I can put in whatever info I want. Like this is a big bag of money. I found it outside the bank. I'm sure they don't want it back but they do want you to hit like and subscribe that's probably right except i can't spell but anyway how do we add in these multiple line text boxes how does this happen is it easy to do of course it is we just jump back in and we add in the multi-line attribute the multi-line attribute lets you specify the number of lines that you want to have and then well have that many lines just show up. There is another option though. There's also a text area option. Let's go jump in and see how that changes it. If we go from multi-line to text area and we jump right back in here, you'll see that the text area is kind of an auto sizing and adjusting one. It doesn't fit perfectly for what we want and we can't specify the size, but it will allow us to just scroll through and kind of resize. Now, I don't particularly like to use the text area. I generally like to use the multi-line option instead. But I wanted to show that because sometimes people see text area and just default to that, don't realize that multi-line is available. What about this header option down here. You might have noticed that I've got this header and it says designer only not shown to players. Let's take a look at what that's showing in the inspector. Here you'll see we've actually got this designer only not shown to players and then right below it we have the notes. This would be for something like special designer notes like this item is only for testers not really used in game. Or maybe this is a special quest item for some other thing. Now, why is it called header and why does it show up like that? Let's take a look. So here's the header attribute and notice that it's right before the notes, which just means that the header is gonna show up before this and anything after this will show up without the header there. Now, when we add a header, it actually adds a little bit of a space right before that entry. Watch as I add another entry down below. I'm gonna add a public string and I'll call this, um, let's call this patch notes. Maybe we've got some extra notes when we patch it and maybe we've got public string tester info or tester instructions, something that we want the testers to test on that thing too. And we save those all off. Let's go look back in the inspector and see that they're all underneath that new header. Now I've got a designer only header section or section that's not shown to players. I might also want to go in there though and have a header of things like combat data. So I could have a he header right here like this header and add in the word combat stats and then maybe add a public int damage that's dealing with the amount of damage that I've got and a public int, uh, let's call it range or attack range and give it some value there. And then if I go back into Unity, you'll see that now I have two sections with two headers to kind of segment out and separate out that data and make it easier for me to find the different pieces of data that I want to find. Again, it's important to note that these are all set up based on the order that they appear in the class so that things that are after a header will appear after the header, just like they do normally. They show up in the order that they're there. So as long as you follow that, it's easy to use headers to make simple groups that make it easier to manage slightly larger items that have multiple fields on them. Now let's dive into some attributes that are a little bit different. These are ones that I think are extremely handy and you should definitely know about. They save you a ton of time and make things extremely easy. These are the menu item attributes. There are three different ones that we'll talk about. The first allows you to put a menu item right at the top of your Unity menu. You can use the menu item attribute and just give it the menu name that you want. You'll need to give it first a root level menu to choose from up top, like I've got my items, and then you need a sub menu item or even a layer or level of menus. I've got items create new item and if I go into my editor, you'll see that I have an items menu right here. And then if I choose that items menu, I have a create new item option. I can select that 
it actually creates a new item, selects it, and highlights the item for me. Let's take a look at how that works and how it happens. So if we open up our code again, you'll see first that we've got our menu item attribute. And the first thing that you need to note, or I guess the second thing after the menu item attribute, is that this method must be static. For this menu item attribute to work, we need to have a static method that's publicly available. Now, it doesn't need to be a custom editor. We don't need to write some extra script for it or anything else. We can if we want to, and that's what a lot of the default examples do. But we really just need a public static method that we can call. My create new item method, you can see here, just instantiates a new item object using the create instance attribute of or method on scriptable object. We give it a name and then we use the asset database to actually create an asset, giving it the folder, save our assets, and then focus and select that object so that it shows up in the inspector. Now you might be coming up with all kinds of cool ideas of things that you can add in as menu items. And I want to make sure that while you know that that's cool and it's a great thing to do, you do need to make sure that your editor code isn't getting leaked into your actual game builds. And that's easy to do when you start mixing in these menu item attributes into non-editor specific files. There's an easy way around it though. You can simply add in the if, hashtag if or pound if, unity underscore editor, right above the attribute and above the method that you're using as this menu item attribute. And then at the end of it, do an end if. That'll make sure that your code doesn't get compiled into your build. So when you go to do a Windows build or a WebGL build or your Android build or you're going to push out to a PlayStation 5, you don't get an, hey, we don't support these editor utilities on the PlayStation 5 error message in your compilation. So just make sure that you wrap them in this. Now let's look at the other two menu item attributes. They're actually quite a bit easier to use and I'd say I use them more often than the main menu item attribute. The first one is just the context menu and this allows you to right click on any script or scriptable object and add in extra items like my add to player which will just add an item directly to my player. In fact, let's try that out right now. I'll hit play. We'll jump in, I'll grab a green button, I'll right click and hit add to player, and you'll see that I've added a button to my player. Let's take a look at how that works and how you can add a context menu item of your own. And here you'll see all we need to do is create a method, doesn't even need to be public, and then add a context menu attribute over it with the menu item name that we want. That'll make this code run on this specific item. Here I just find the inventory and tell it to add this instance. Let's take a look at how we can add that to a field as well though, because if you look down here at my number to add, I've got a right click option to add 10 of an item to a player. Let's hit play and try that out and then we'll see how it works. So here we are, I'll right click, hit add to player, and my inventory has filled up with buttons. And you can see I even got an error because I added more buttons than I had slots. Let's take a look at how that works. To add an attribute to a field, we use the context menu item instead of context menu. Remember, context menu will put it at that mono behavior or at the top of the level, the top of the scriptable objects level where you get that context menu. If you want it on the actual field, we use context menu item. Now, the way that that works is we also have to specify the name of the function that we want to use. Now, you could put this in quotes and match the name exactly, but the name of property or the field or method, whatever this is, the little shortcut of using name of, we'll just convert that to a string and then make it work so that if we rename our add items to player, it will keep its name matching here. So I'd always recommend if you're going to use the context menu item, use the name of method for your function name. Inside of our add items to player, we just loop through zero to the number to add, which is just that field that we had, and then add those items to the object or add those items to our inventory. Now I could blab about how useful these context menus are and I kind of did and then I went back and cut it all out because you don't need to listen to me blab. Just know that they're handy, they're useful, and you can use them at runtime when you're debugging, working on things and building stuff up. You can also use them at edit time when you're setting up data and creating data. If you want to have it, just have an option so you can right click and set up a whole bunch of stuff. It's an easy to do thing. You just add in your context menu or your context menu item or the menu item. The next attribute is one that everybody should know about and use, and I was really happy to find out about when I did, and that's the selection base attribute. If you're like me and you build game objects where you have a visual representation that's slightly separated from your code or your logic representation, usually by putting the visual part as a child, you've probably run into the issue where you go select your object and it selects the model child instead of the object that you wanted or the key game object that has your scripts on it. 
to make that change or to make it so that your object automatically gets selected, you can go into your code, modify any script or component on the game object at the level that you want to be selected, and add the selection base attribute right above the class. If I save that off, jump back into Unity, and now unselect and reselect my object, you'll see that the selection or the selected object is going to be this base one or the one that I added the selection base to, the inspectable instead of the model. Very handy, it saved me a ton of time, especially when you have a large hierarchy of characters or models or these complex things. It can come in really, really useful, make it so that you select the thing that you want to select every time you click on it. So try it out, use it in your games, I think that you'll love it. The next attribute I wanted to mention is less likely to be used. It's something that not a lot of people do use, but a lot of people ask me about and wonder if there's a way to do it. And that's the runtime initialize on load. A lot of the time people wonder if there's a main entry point or a way that they can just tie into something without having a game object and make some code run. This attribute allows you to do just that. And there are five different times that you can tie in. After a scene loads, before a scene loads, when the, all the assemblies are loaded, right before the splash screen, or sometime during the subsystem registration, which that one I'm not completely sure on. But the others I think are pretty obvious and pretty self-explanatory. So if you ever need to run something without having a game object and you've wanted to try this out, check it out. The next attribute I want to talk about isn't a Unity specific one. It's a C Sharp one that does some cool stuff in Unity, and that's the system.serializable attribute. If you've ever wanted to make a bunch of data and have subclasses and see that data on a scriptable object or on a mono behavior, and you weren't able to, it was probably because the system.serializable attribute was missing. If you add that, your class will show up in the inspector. You'll be able to expand it out, see the publicly accessible data, and modify it just like you can with a scriptable object or a mono behavior. The other cool benefit is that you can also easily then just serialize it out using the JSON serializer. If you've ever had a problem where your subclasses aren't serializing, you're probably missing that attribute. Adding this attribute helps a lot, so I highly recommend that you experiment with it, try it out, and see how it can change the way that you store data. Now I want to wrap this up by saying that while there are a lot of cool attributes and I've shown you some, there are... Now I want to wrap this up by saying that while I showed you a couple really cool attributes, there's a whole lot more to attributes in the attribute system. If you're really into it and you really want to spend some time with it, there's a lot you can learn and a lot you can play with. I wouldn't recommend that you dive maybe too deep and spend too much of your time on it, but maybe do a little bit of experimentation and exploring and see what's out there. A couple really cool examples would be things like the easy buttons package that you can just go grab that will allow you to add a button attribute that just adds a button to your inspector and allows you to click through and run any code. Or things like Odin Inspector, which is an extremely popular and well-loved tool that a lot of developers use to add a whole bunch of extra attributes and other things on top of the attributes. But if you're ever looking for inspiration or just ideas on things that attributes could do, may just go look at what they've done and you'll come up with all kinds of cool ideas. Now, attributes aren't the only thing that you can do to make your code better, but they're definitely one, and they're something that I think everybody should at least loosely understand and know that they can create their own of, they can modify them, they can get new ones, and they can make it so that their game is a little bit easier to work on. All right, thanks for watching. I hope that you learned something and you can start to use attributes in your own projects. Don't forget to check out the Ultimate Game Dev course down below and make sure that you hit the like, subscribe, and share buttons. They really help. It makes a big difference and I really do appreciate it. Also, if you have some cool attributes you're interested in, make sure that you drop them down in the comments so everybody can know there's probably at least a couple cool ones that I should be using that I'm not and I'd love to hear about them. All right, thanks again and goodbye.